Good morning and welcome to our uh, second session in August of our summer series. And uh, you are welcome here. Oh, look at that. <laughs> they rang the bell right on time. And uh, this part is, uh, I think, a very good part. It is a lot less sitting back and listening as it is, and being challenged, as it is taking part in uh, almost like an annual meeting, if you will. Because in our Safe Sanctuaries policy, which you will all get next week if you don't have your copy, we have handed them out several times, which was ratified by the Church Council in 2015, uh, one, of the, one of the commitments we make to our safety of our children is to yearly do a continuing ed sort of piece about our safe sanctuaries, to continue to keep it at the forefront, to, can you, to, to continue to update our best practices if possible, um, and those sort of things in terms of policy. One of the things that we've noted as church leaders, as, as deacons and such, is that there is quite a bit of movement of this uh, of, of looking at our uh, policies uh, and a lot of that is fueled by events that are finally coming to light in a good way. Of course it's painful to address these events but it's a lot better the pain is a lot better than simply suppressing them and acting like it hasn't happened and leaving a trail of wounded people and kids behind. So this today might be work that makes us squirm a little bit but it's good squirming. It's good. It's fitting what our church wants to do and be. So today is part one. Next Sunday is part two. And we have Kathy Berkey Weens to come speak to us. And her husband Tim is here as well. Kathy is not a stranger to our church. She presented her life story several years ago here. They live in Newton, Kansas. And she holds a graduate degree. She holds graduate degrees in education and mental health counseling. She is a licensed professional counselor and trauma recovery coach, and we have talked quite a bit about trauma, especially in terms of in the school and ACEs, um, adverse childhood experiences, and we talked last Sunday about then what our response might be in building resilience in, in light of what the, the community is doing and the schools are doing there. Um, so she is a... Uh, a trauma, a trauma recovery coach. For 28 years, Kathy was an early childhood educator, teaching both children and adults. Since 2012, she's worked with churches teaching child protection and sexual abuse prevention classes, and uh, we're glad to have her here. Uh, in 2013, she published her childhood memoirs, which we have in our library, called Bars, Dumps, and Other Childhood Hangouts. And she, since she spoke to us, her book, a new book has been published, Please Don't Send Me Back. Uh, she will share about her life experience and how we as a church can uh, be a safe sanctuary for children. And we have asked, and we do continue to ask, that everybody that works with children uh, that can be here today and, uh, and next Sunday as well. Um, on your sheets, you can see her website and her blog space called Wisdom for the Wounded, and I invite you to, to check that out as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the God of love and protection. You are the God that calls us to be the same. Um, and we admit, we haven't always been so good at it. And yet, within the midst of that, um, Lord, I pray that, that uh, we n might not just be sitting here wringing our hands, but that we might truly look for the best way that we can work with our children, that we can work uh, through the traumas of, of, of abuse and uh, the traumas of poverty and the traumas of power abuse and, and all those, those things. Lord, help us with wisdom. Help us to be an active, loving people. Give Kathy the words to speak and us the ears to hear. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Throughout, she will, ask, she will be asking us to share a little bit in terms of some of the questions she asks. We're going to do it with microphones because we are recording. This recording will also, can also serve as future uh, continuing ed for those who weren't able to be here. So 
uh, please have patience, raise your hand, we will get the mics to you, and it'll not just be at the end, it'll be throughout. Let's welcome Kathy back to Bueller Mennonite Church. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, just let me get situated here a little bit. I see somebody's coffee back here, and I'm really scared I'm going to spill true. it. So, <laughs> All right, so we're here today to talk about safe sanctuaries. And, you know, this is really important work. Caring for, valuing, and protecting children is some of the most important work that we do in the church. And so thank you for letting me come here. I'm so glad that you are having Sundays where you talk about this issue. And as Pastor Wilmer said, yes, it is a difficult issue, and yet we are doing something by talking about it. And that's important, and that's good. And that makes a church a safer place, just that you are willing and open to having these discussions. There we go. Uh, Pastor Wilmer already talked about my book a little bit, so I won't say anything more about that. My second book um, is coming out. It is not published yet. Um, <laughs> that happened last time when I came to. I, do, I did have that on my website. But um, anyway, it's, it's about the second part of my childhood. And, you know, these stories are difficult. This, writing this book was difficult. So it's just it's my own journey and my own process. But I'm hoping by the end of this year it will be out. I'll just say a little bit more about my family. Um, my husband Tim is here. We live just outside of Newton. Next to me there in that picture is my daughter Ruth and our youngest daughter Ruth. She has followed in Tim's footsteps. Tim is a family practice doctor in Newton and she is in residency in her third year of family practice residency at Wesley in Wichita. And next to her is her husband Matt and he works for Radio Kansas in uh, funds development. He's from Ohio. And next to Matt is our oldest daughter, Tara, and she works in St. Paul, Minnesota for the Minnesota State Health Department. She's an epidemiologist. And she's doing some really interesting things with the opioid epidemic and just all kinds of public health stuff. What will soon go into our family picture, and I'll need to get a new picture, Tara is getting married in October uh, to Doss, who is a, a wonderful young man from India, and so we will be welcoming him into our family soon, too. So that's a little bit about me. All right, I want to talk a little bit about Dove's Nest. Maybe many of you have heard of that. This is a wonderful organization to find out more about child protection, about different policies. Their website is just a wealth of information. I'm going to point out two things here. This book, Let the Children Come, was written by Jeanette Harder. and She's one of the founders of Dove's Nest. And it's a great resource, not just for talking about sexual abuse in the church, but for talking about all kinds of abuse. Um, you know, we, we need to recognize that it's not just sexual abuse that children experience, but it's many kinds of abuse, and, and those all need to be taken seriously in the church. This book is a good resource for churches because it's set up in 12 chapters, and at the end there are questions, so it could be used, like in a Sunday school class or a small group setting. So that's a good resource. Um, Circle of Grace, do you guys use that curriculum? I forgot. Wednesday night. Yeah. Great, okay. That is a really good curriculum. I've taught it many times. I do a, a presentation on teaching it. And what I like about that curriculum is that it empowers children to say, and if you've worked with it, you know that you have the circle of grace. God and the child are in the circle of grace. And it empowers the child to say, I get to decide who comes into my circle of grace and who doesn't. So it's really teaching about consent and empowerment over you know, what happens to the child. And then another important piece is if something does happen to me, if someone comes into my circle of grace and I feel uncomfortable with that, I can tell a trusted adult. So that's another really protective factor if you guys are doing circle of grace too. Okay, our goals for today, what I'm hoping we can talk about, and then expand on that next week, is what is the church? What do we want for the children here at Bueller? And then we're going to talk about what happens to children, go over some statistics. We'll look at some situations in the church, and that's where we'll be having some discussions. How would you handle that? I'm also going to talk about why the church is at risk, because as Pastor Wilmer said, there are many things coming to light, and that's a good thing. 
And so we need to examine why has this been happening for so many years? What can we look at or do differently to make churches safer for children? Um, okay, so that's about what we're going to go through. All right. First, I'm going to tell you a little story about a young girl. There once was a young girl who lived with her biological family. There was her mother, her stepfather, and her half-brother. The young girl's family lived in extreme poverty, and state assistance was their main source of income. The adults were both addicted to alcohol, and this created many problems. The young girl suffered abuse, neglect, and abandonment, but she survived. At age 10, the child was taken away from this family and placed in a children's home and then in foster care. In her foster family, she went to church. In this church, she found love, acceptance, and hope for her life. Because of her foster family and the church community, no longer did she see herself as poor and insignificant. No longer did she see herself as a sexual object only to be used by men. In this new life and new church, she began to see herself as a beloved child of God. Her life improved, and she found the courage to start on the journey, on a journey of healing and finding faith in her life. And if you haven't guessed from seeing the cover of the book, that little girl is me. And that explains why I am here today, why I'm talking about this. I've worked with children for many years in my life, um, but I know what it is like to be such a child, to have experienced that. But I also see why it is so important for churches to rally around children, to care for children, to value them. That made a huge difference in my life. Um, my home church was Bellwood Mennonite Church, and that was a wonderful place for me. I felt cared for and valued and loved in that church. And when children see that from, from people in the church, what that tells them, it shows them the love that God has for them. And for me, and for all of us, I think, that makes all the difference in our life, to start that relationship to God, to see how loved and valued we are by God. Okay. So next I'm going to talk about just what church is. Well, first, church is a place to find God. That's what we think about. We come here because we want a relationship with God. We want a re relationship with Jesus. So that's a primary reason we come to church. But church is also a place to connect with others. We have the fellowship of believers. And this is so important for children because when children experience trauma, that happens in the context of relationships. And we're going to talk in a little bit about the percentage of how many children are abused by people that they know. So that's happening with someone that they know. But the healing also happens in relationship. I found such good relationships at Bellwood. And so the more positive relationships that children can have, the more healing that they can have in their life. And not just for children who have been abused, that's important for all children. But we need to make sure those relationships are safe. Okay. Church is also a place to feel loved and valued, and I've spoke about that already. We all want to feel loved and valued in church. Um, for me, at Bellwood, it was I really felt that care and that valuing. Sunday was my favorite day of the week, so that tells you how much that church meant to me. And then, church also needs to be a safe place. It needs to be a safe place for everyone, but especially for children. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Okay, so now we're going to have some of that discussion that Pastor Wilmer was talking about. I want you to think about what do you want children to receive from Bueller Mennonite? You know, the short time that they have here, um, 18 years for some of them, some of them less than that, but what are you hoping that they will take away from Bueller Mennonite? I'm going to write these things down here, and then I'll leave it with you. And maybe this can be a working document, you know, for you to think about as you review safe sanctuaries, as you make policies for children. What are your goals um, for children, for children's ministries here? Well, raise your, raise your hand. If you feel welcome. 
feel welcome, okay? And use the mic. <laughs> I'll repeat it too so it gets on the audio. That our church is a safe place for children as well. Okay. Church is a safe place. Okay. A network of friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that connection with other people. It should be the foundation of both, <clears throat> I mean, like with our kids, it's that foundation of being a Mennonite or being a Christian, mm -hmm. in addition to that foundation of what yeah, friendship is, what love is, and so on. So a foundation. Okay. So foundation of Christian identity and Christian fellowship. Could we say that? Okay. I'm going to put Christian slash Mennonite. Because I think there really are unique things about the Mennonite church. And we want kids to get that. So, foundation of Christian Mennonite, what did I say? Um, beliefs. I don't think that's what I said, but that's what I'll put down. And and connection with others. Okay. Listen, listen to them, respect them, yes. talk to them. Mm -hmm. We don't talk to our youth here. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Yeah. We want to be able to listen to children, respect them, and talk to them. And what I'm hearing you say in that, we want to talk to them and not at them. And it's not that we don't give guidance to children. We certainly need to do that. But to have that respect, children are fellow human beings. Yes, they're different than, than adults because they're children. Yes, they need guidance and education. But first and foremost, they are our fellow human beings. And with that, I would just add that often we talk about our children as the future of the church. And I would just challenge us, as someone has challenged me that way, to say, no, they are the church. Um, <laughs> you can't take them away from the church, nor are we waiting for them to graduate into being the church. Exactly. They are the church. Yes, that's a very good point. So children are the church. Okay. Did you have some? He's got one back there. Uh, you your... <clears throat> we're talking about the children. Learn, uh, teach them how to read the Bible, learn Bible stories. Mm -hmm. I can remember as a child, I remember my Bible stories. That's one of the big things. Yeah. And that's so important because that's, that's a resiliency factor. When they have that, that in their brain and they remember those stories, that helps us in our lives. So I'll put teach Bible stories. The listening and respect to talk to them, that's what builds your relationship to where you get something. And I look back on my mother. Uh, she was our Wednesday night teacher, and she was a Sunday school teacher. And that's where we learned the Bible. And going down the road, when we went somewhere, it was Christian songs or Jesus loves me and songs like that that we sang. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what, what should I write down here? Uh, like I say, relationship. Relationship. And, and 
together with the good Lord's music and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relationship, music, like listening to music and listening to children. I think it's kind of okay. I think included and supported without judgment. Yes, very important. And that's so important without judgment. How do we let children know that they are safe and loved and valued here while also letting them know certain things, you know, that they need to do and correcting certain behaviors? Anybody else? That God is love. That, that when somebody asks them, what's God? God is love. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they just wrap themselves around that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God is love. And I think, too, the best way we can do that is by showing love to them, the example. You know, we can say that to them, but showing them they are valuable and loved will help them know God loves and values them. Yes? Uh, in, in your thinking that maybe stories are good, and, but... I think uh, we need to work at discerning what stories are applicable to us because there are some pretty bad stories in the Bible. Oh, I'm so, and, yeah. Uh, it, there's been people that justify their actions based upon those stories. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think some kind of discernment mm -hmm. is important. I'm so glad to hear you say that because, you know, I've, I've taught Sunday school for years and years, and some days I just, you know, it would be in the curriculum, and I'd say, I'm not teaching that to kids. I'll just pick my own story um, because, yeah, not everything in the Bible is appropriate for children to hear, and we need to be careful. We want to teach the, ch the stories to the children because that's beneficial to them. Not because we, our church, is, is saying, well, they have to know all these stories. They need to know some stories. Do you catch the difference here? It's not about what the adult wants to impose on the child in terms of teaching, but it's what's going to be best for the child, understanding who they are, understanding their developmental level. So, And I'm going to have a stop there, so I'll just put appropriate stories, appropriate Bible stories. And one thing that, that I'll say with all of this, um, I just love all of these things that, that you said here. This is really good. And oftentimes, and I, I know, I still do this and I've done it. When we, when we talk about children, when we pray about children, we say, our children. And of course that feels right and natural. Well, yeah, there are children. But really, are they? Really, they're God's children. And we get the benefit of having them in our lives, you know, present with us for 18 years. And, you know, I get the benefit of being in my children's life all their life, but, or as long as I'm alive, anyway. So I think that's important to think about sometimes, too, when we're working with children. These are God's children first, and then there are children. Okay. So, good document there. I hope that's helpful for you. We're going to go through some statistics now. And, I, you know, not all children have this loving, wonderful church. And I'm going to go so far as to even say the statistics that we're talking about probably pertain to some children that are in this church currently. Uh, more likely than not... There are children in this church that are experiencing abuse. And I know that's difficult to hear, but doing these kinds of 
workshops is something that's going to help protect them. And I say this because I don't want us to think these statistics are just about the kids out there. We need to recognize they could very likely be about children in our church currently. Okay. So first, and let me say too, you may have heard some of these statistics, some of this stuff you may have gone over, but that's okay. I look at this kind of like first aid training. You know, when I was a teacher, I had to get recertified in first aid every like three years. And so hearing the same thing over and over is good. We need to review these things. All right. Um, boys, and I'm going to do this as a little quiz. Boys who will experience, uh, will be sexually exploited by the age of 18. Is that one in six, one in three, one in five, or one in ten? Just yell it out. What do you think? One in six? Okay. Who said that? Okay. Well, I have a little activity here. These are my answer balls, so. <laughs> and you get a little treat in it, too. <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and read that for us? That's the answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, Mike, yeah. Boys who will be sexually exploited by age 18, 1 and 6. Okay. And then the next is girls. Same question. Is it 1 in 3, 1 in 5, 1 in 10, or 1 in 20? What do you think? Three, one, in three. 1 in 3? Okay. Give her that. <laughs> <laughs> Girls who will be sexually exploited by age 18, 1 in 3. Okay. And then the percentage of children that know their attacker, 93%, 34.2%, 58.7, 7 or 7%. 93%. Yeah, that's right. You can just take the treat. You don't have to read the question. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 93, 93%. And so when we talk about stranger danger, not that that's not an important thing to tell our children, but the reality is it's going to be someone that they know. And we'll talk about the percentage of family member and acquaintances in just a little bit. But it's someone that they know and probably someone they have a close relationship with. Okay. Next, number of attackers that are family members. What do you think that one is? Is it 97%, 34.2, 58.7, or 7% of the attackers are family members? 58.7. Okay. I'll let you go ahead and read that one. 34.2% <laughs> of attackers were family members. Yeah, so it is less. less it, the family members are the lesser of those two big numbers. And that kind of tells you the last one. How many were acquaintances? Well, maybe. How many were acquaintances? 93%, 34.2, 58.7, or 7%? Remember, 97% of children know their attackers, and 34.7 are family members. For 34.2 are family members. 58.7. Yeah, 58.7. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then the last one: What percentage of the attackers were strangers? Seven percent. Yep. And you get a turn. <laughs> so again, the idea of stranger danger 
Um, you know, that's what we would love to believe. We want to believe it's the other person out there that's coming in and harming our children. But the reality is, it's us. And I say that not in a shaming way to you, but it's those within our communities and within our families. Okay, more statistics. Um, I'm not going to go into depth about a lot of these things. Um, they're important things to, to talk about, but we, can't, we don't have time this morning. Number seven is one in five youth will receive a sexual, or, a sexual approach or solicitation over the Internet in what amount of time? Will, they, will one in five youth receive it? Did they receive it in the past year, the past month, the past week, or the past five years? What do you think? Past week. Past week? Okay. Who said that? <laughs> you can share it with someone. <laughs> can you go ahead and, yeah, go ahead and read that? Read it. One, one in five youth received a sexual approach or solicitation over the Internet in the past year. Year. Mm -hmm. So that's good that it's not a week or a month, but still that's one in five. So we think about five children and they're receiving that. The Internet, that's a huge issue. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that's may, that number is maybe a little bit low. And that would be a good um, presentation to have sometime when you're doing these Sundays on on abuse, because um, yeah, that's a it's a big issue. Okay, uh, number eight: the average age for first-time abuse is what for boys and what for girls? And I don't have the number up there. So, who wants to answer that? And who wants a treat? I'm going to give it to Tim. <laughs> that's the old standby. <laughs> Uh, for boys, it's 9.9 .9 years and 9.6 years for girls. So that's the average. That means there are children below that and children above that. So when we know those numbers, I mean, not that we don't need to be watching all children, but we know that's a, that can be a target. The number nine, many um, child sexual victims Sexual abuse victims never disclose their abuse to anyone. Less than what percent of child sexual abuse is reported to the police? Ten? Who said that? Less than 12% of child abuse is reported to police. So it's very close, 10%, very close, yeah. And what that tells us is there is a lot out there that we don't know about. And not just with children, but there's a lot of adults sitting in our congregation who were abused as children and as adults, but who are not sharing their story. And that's another reason to make churches safe, is because when a church feels safe, then not only children may feel more free to share, but adults will feel more free to come forward and tell their story. And so that's an important piece of that. And I believe that caring for and helping survivors is a part of child safety. Because think about it. If a survivor can get up and share her story and say, when I was a 10-year-old girl, this happened to me, and there's another 10-year-old girl in the congregation, and she says, wow, that same thing is happening to me. And she told, maybe I could tell somebody too. And that's what we want. We want children to be able to share. Okay. Number 10, false reports constitute what to what percent of abuse cases? And who wants this? I'm just going to... Anybody? I'm not going to give it to Tim again. You want it? No. Okay. 
<laughs> oh, sorry. There. False reports constitute one to four percent of all reported cases. And many times we want to say when we hear about um, alleged abuse, we want to say, oh, but what if he didn't do it? And I use he because primarily it's men that abuse, not that women don't, but primarily it's men. Um, so we need to know that statistic, that that number is very, very low. And when that's what we focus on, um, that, that is not putting children first. That is not protecting children. Yeah, so I just think it's very important to know that number is really low. I'm just going to go through these last two. Children with disabilities are four to ten times more vulnerable to sexual abuse. So if you have children with disabilities, either physical or mental disabilities, we really need to watch them because think about it, especially for severely disabled children, if they can't talk, if they need to have their diapers changed, you know, things like this, um, that makes them very vulnerable to abusers. And the last one, child molestation is one of the most underreported crimes. Only 1 to 10 percent is ever disclosed. So your 10 percent back there is right. And I, I kind of put that in there again because I think that's so important for us to recognize that many people don't come forward. Uh, Boz Trevigian, he's the founder of GRACE, which stands for Godly Response to Abuse in Christian Environments. He, he says that in our congregations, there are 20 to 25 percent of people who have been abused as a child. So think about that. If you have a congregation of 100 people, 25 of those people are dealing with this. And, and like we've said, oftentimes we never know it. Okay. All right. Um, how off is that clock, Pastor Wilmer? How much time do we have? It's off by about four minutes. Oh, shoot. Okay. All right. Well, I want to go through this. What is appropriate in Sunday school? And have a little bit of discussion again about this. Um, this is something that Marlene Bogart put out, and she did kind of the original, original Safe Sanctuaries training in Western District Conference. Um, and again, if you've heard this before, that's okay. We need to review it. So a male teacher of fifth grade boys invites two students to go to a movie. Is that appropriate? Is that okay? Is that not okay? What do you think about that? Okay, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing one down. Okay. Would you share why that doesn't feel appropriate? Why it's a thumbs down for you? Even though there's two boys, it still puts them at a vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. And it's only, he's only inviting a small group. So that, that's a red flag for me. Right. Mm -hmm. And your policy talks about the two-person rule. And I think the two-person rule is good to have in all situations. You know, more than one adult to, so people can stay accountable. Now, a good thing about that, did you want to say, what did you want to say? Because you kind of had a, didn't know. I think this, you know, the good thing is, yeah, we want kids to have relationships with other adults in the church. That can be a good thing, but we need to monitor those things, and we need to make boundaries and make sure that the person really cares about children and is not trying to find um, a victim. A teacher offers a blessing to each student by placing her hands on the child's sh shoulder. So this could be when they're maybe leaving Sunday school or in Sunday school. What about that? Is that okay? It's good, not, I don't know, or bad. Okay, you're saying good. You want to share? Well, the, shoulder is, the shoulder is an appropriate spot. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And they get that that loving touch, mm -hmm. and that, again, makes them feel valued and, okay. The problem I would have with this is that, well, two things. We don't know what touch has meant to that child before they came to Sunday school. 
Maybe, you know, they were pushed out of the house because we're late for Sunday school. We got to get to church. And so the touch on their shoulder was not a good touch. And maybe that had been preceded by other, you know, abusive touches. And so we don't know for sure how that touch is going to feel to every child. The other piece of it, when we talked about circle of grace, uh, that empowers children to give consent. And so I think any time an adult wants to touch a child in any way, even though it's a very loving way, we say, may I touch you? Would you like a pat on the shoulder and a blessing? Or would you like a high five? Or do you want nothing? Respecting that child to say, this, you know, you can say what you want. You have consent over how your body is touched. Uh, and then a teacher invites one youth over to her house or home. Yeah. Again, that, that feels uncomfortable. Right. Why not the whole group? Again, looking at motives. Why, what, does this, what is this person doing? Why are they doing it? Why are they just inviting one person? Now, sometimes we have mentoring programs, so that could happen in a mentoring program. And again, you know, it's nice to develop close relationships, but we don't just have blind trust over everyone and what they're doing and just say, oh, well, they're a nice person. I've known them for years, so sure, that, that's nothing bad that they want to do. We need to, we need to think about what's going on. Okay, a few more situations here. Okay. Um, a teacher insists that all students in the second grade hold hands during prayer. It's kind of that same thing. They're, you're forcing children to touch another child. And, you know, we, again, we're sending them the message that you don't have control over your body. An adult is going to tell you what you do with your body. And then if they say, I don't want to do that, oh, then are they misbehaving? Or can we respect their wishes? Uh, your church, <laughs> this is a good one, your church committee, education committee, gladly accepts all offers of anyone who is willing to teach. Now, I understand this question. Um, like I said, I've been on uh, church education committees in multiple places. I've taught Sunday school. I know oftentimes in, you know, end of July, 1st of August, somebody is standing up here saying, we need somebody, we need another teacher for fourth grade, or we need a junior high sponsor. You know, we're kind of begging for people to come. And that's a reality. And it's also, I know, it's not always easy to work with kids in the church. Kids have a lot of energy. And um, so sometimes that's not always easy. But I'm going to say that when we have to do that, and I might step on some toes here, but when someone has to stand up in that pulpit and practically beg the church to get teachers for Sunday school, that puts children at risk. Because we may be tempted to do this, except anyone, because we need somebody bad. So that's just something to think about. How do we value children's programs and value adults' participation in them? And again, it's a lot of work, and it's hard work. I get it. I know. But we really need to think about who we are having do that work. Um, a Sunday school teacher holds class at her house on the spur of the moment, and parents have no advance notice. That okay? Not okay? Why is that not okay? I know for training, parents need to know where yeah. their kids are. Right. So yeah. Okay yeah. And teachers need to be held accountable. I mean, not that that's a bad thing to want to do. They might get an idea and say, oh, Sunday morning, I woke up with this great idea. We're going to go uh, to my house and do this activity. And not that that's a bad thing, but they need to let parents know. Because, again, if there is bad intent on the part of the Sunday school teacher, um, this would be a way to do that. And again, we can't just be fully trusting of, of what other adults are doing. We need to keep other adults accountable and be watching. Now these are not in what Marlene put out. These are two that I put together. Um, and so this is talking about congregations. What's in appropriate in congregations? So number seven, and this is a little bit about what you were talking about, Pastor Wilmore, is these things are coming out in churches. So 
What do we do about it? And I would encourage you not just with these two questions, this is very minimal, but to have more conversations around these kinds of questions, to prepare yourself for what you would do when situations like this happen. Because like I said, more likely than not, these things are happening to kids at, at Bueller. Okay, so a longtime member of a church is arrested on charges of child abuse. What should church leaders do? And it's okay if we don't have anything to say. Maybe it's just bringing that question up for you to think about that. Oh, it's in the back. You would have to address it as a church. You do not ignore it. Then you need to find out who that person has touched and find out if anything has happened. Do an internal investigation. But bring it up so everybody knows what's going on. Do not hide it. Do not make it a secret. That's just wrong. Right. To bring it out, to bring it open, to be open and honest about it. And I will go a step further. It's good to bring in an outside organization to help you with that process. Uh, Grace is a good, I mentioned Grace before, they do good investigations. Um, Faith Trust Institute also does investigations of churches. So I would say do both. Be open and honest and talk about it. Let the congregation know and also have people come in and help you process that, that because that is a time of high emotional there's a lot going on when that happens, and there's going to be people that say, no, he didn't do it, and then people saying, yes, he did. There's going to be survivors that will be triggered, um, and then so lots of people need to be cared for, so, so doing both. And then the last one, and this is the last I'll do, um, a child tells her Sunday school teacher that a youth at church has kissed her on the mouth. Now, a child is elementary age, 6 through 12. Youth would be a high schooler. Um, 14 through 18. What should happen there? And again, it's okay if we don't say anything. It's um, just to get us thinking about these kinds of things. What would we do? And you have some of that in your policy, and we're going to talk about that next week, too. We'll go over your policy. Okay, I see on this clock it's a little past 1020, so uh, that's our time to, to stop, right? Do we have any time for questions or comments? Actually, yeah, my clock says 1016, so we okay. have four more minutes for, for any comments or questions. Okay, great. Please. Yeah, any other thoughts or ideas that you have? I know I've said some challenging things this morning, but I think we really need to speak openly and honestly when we're talking about child safety. One of the things I noticed our, our, our uh, policy does not have is any mention of going to the outside and especially taking it to the law. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and I don't know why that is, uh, Exactly, but I, I wonder if there isn't an instinct to say we can take care of this ourselves and the world doesn't need to know our baggage, but we will take care of it. Can you talk a little bit more about how we invite the law, or especially in a small town where we know the policemen and, mm -hmm. and all that fun stuff? Yeah, and you know, the legal system certainly is not perfect. Um, and when we think about the um, you know, SRS, it's DCF now, I think, but you know, they're not perfect either, but I think it is important. I did notice that in your policy. I think it is important to report to the police, to report to Child Protective Services. Um, and again, it, when you report, you don't have to absolutely know that abuse is happening, just if you suspect. So if you're seeing something and it makes you feel uncomfortable and you suspect abuse is happening, that is a time to report. But I would certainly say when you know something has happened, when someone has come forward and disclosed abuse, that should be taken to the police. And the reason for that is in the church, we call it sin, but it is a crime. To abuse a child, whether physically, sexually, emotionally, any kind of abuse is a crime. 
in all 50 of the United States. So that's why we need to take it to the police. Um, see, I'm trying to think of other things. I was thinking about that. I think, and when next Sunday I'll talk about the risks. One of the risks is that we want to keep it in-house and we don't want to, you know, kind of air our dirty, language, dirty um, laundry out to the community. But that's, that puts churches at risk. That's kind of, it's not really sweeping it under the rug because you're open about it in the church. But um, because it's a crime, it needs to be reported to the authorities. You know, if someone was stealing cars or if someone was breaking into your homes and stealing, you know, your valuables, we would report that to the police probably um, to recognize it's a crime. And I know oftentimes within the church community we, we speak of it as sin, but I think we need to watch that kind of language. One more question. Okay. Yes. I think also reporting it to outside authorities gives the opportunity for um, if abuse is happening within the church, um, it's also likely that it might be happening outside the church and giving mm -hmm. victims outside the church an opportunity to know what's going on and have the opportunity to come forward. Right. And are you speaking of, so if one perpetrator, there may be other people that have been abused by that person and they can come forward. Yes, they may be involved elsewhere in the community. Yes, great point. Thank you. Because what you're saying, yes, this is, statistics tell us that perpetrators have more than one victim. Almost always, they have more than one victim. Okay, thank you. Well, the bell did ring. This is a, a, tough, uh, a tough conversation, but a good one, as we've mentioned. And if, you got, if, if some of you feel triggered or you feel the weight of this, uh, I, I'll invite us to a moment of